All right, so welcome to Real Vision Access. Uh, today, we've decided to do something a little bit different, but because usually it's behind a paywall, but today we, we have a, such an important guest that we're putting it out on everything, YouTube, Facebook, every social media you can imagine, trying to get it in front of as many people as possible. And so uh, our only ask is that everyone shares this with your friends, your family, uh, you know, people that you love and people that you think should see it. So we think everyone should see it. But today, our guest is Ben Hunt of Epsilon Theory. Welcome, Ben. Hey, man. Great to be here. Hey, and so Ben is the author of Epsilon Theory. I say author, but it's it's maybe you're you're the uh, the man with all the strings behind and the, the puppets, right? And briefly for the uninitiated, what is Epsilon Theory? Why just start it? Uh, how are we here? Uh, so. You know, I started writing this blog, uh, and I started writing it, gosh, in the, the summer of 2013, so, you know, uh, six and a half years ago now. And I, I, I was writing it because I had, had wound down my, my, my hedge fund. Uh, you know, we, we had never lost money for clients, but what we were doing just wasn't working. I mean, it was single-digit returns, uh, you know, after... You know, we did. We had a career year in 08. We did well, but it's like from March of 09 forward, it was like you went to the wall and you, you flipped a switch. Uh, you know, on on our returns, we just flatlined. Again, never lost money, but it wasn't working the way uh, it it should. And so we gave all the money back to our investors, and and I and I started writing really just for myself to try to figure out well, you know, how do you think about investing uh, in in a world where the fundamentals don't seem to matter, where the, the, the touchstones for successful uh, money management don't seem to work anymore. And, you know, the, the, the title of the blog, and again, I'm just writing it to myself, I, I, I called it Epsilon Theory, uh, because it's a, it's a take on two different things, right? The first is that most of money management is, is all about alpha and beta, right? We're all familiar with that being the uh, you know, the things we talk about uh, when we talk about asset allocation. But there's a third Greek letter to that equation, right? And, and it's epsilon. It's, and, and usually the epsilon term is the error term. It's, it's what you have left over after you've tried to explain alpha and beta, right? Then you've got epsilon, the error term. And I started writing because it was, it, it really seems to me, and even more so today, that what we think of as error is not really error. What, what's embedded in that so-called error term is the, the behavior of human beings in these market conditions, is the strategic interactions of people uh, and central banks and governments and the like. It, it, it really is then this, this mix of what we used to call error being not error, but where we can get real information and, and think of it rigorously, and then combine that with game theory, which is my, my academic career, that's how epsilon theory came up. So, I, you know, I started writing this to myself. I, I sent out the first note, I think, to maybe about 100 friends and, you know, family clients. And for whatever reason, it really struck a chord. So we've got about, you know, more than 100,000 subscribers to this now. It's, um, <laughs> you know, we never marketed it. It's all been through word of mouth. And, and, and I, you know, I think I'm a pretty decent writer, but what I think is really driving the success is that it's, it, it, it's hitting everybody pretty hard, right? Because we, we, we know that we're being, I'll say, talked down to. Uh, we know that there are, you know, something's going on other than our traditional measurements of alpha and beta and all like that. And so just having a, a place where we can talk about it for reals, right? Is I, I think that's what has really driven the um, the the power of, of getting people together to 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 read and talk uh, about epsilon theory. I mean, that's a great answer. I mean, it certainly resonated with me. I mean, the reason we're sitting here today is because I mean, I, I'm such a big fan, and I've been you know pitching to get you back on here as much as possible. But um, I like to jump, like start, jump in. 
you wrote a blog in 2018 called The Pension Cartoon. And I want to talk a little bit about, like, you know, what a narrative cartoon is. But I'll, yep. the title of that uh, the piece, right, is basically based on an article that was written in the, uh, the Wall Street Journal called Chicago's New Idea to Fix Its Pension Deficit, Take on More Debt. And um, you wrote about cartoons and pensions. What exactly is the significance of the cartoonification of politics and markets and the pension system? Well, when I when I use the word cartoon, I'm meaning that, and I'll, I'll say the technical sense, right? A, a cartoon is an abstraction, but it's 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 you know more than just a, a drawing of a thing, right? It's really an abstraction of an abstraction, right? So so we're when when you when you're watching a cartoon, it, it's not just oh I'm seeing this abstraction of you know a you know a talking rabbit right it, it it's it's the talking rabbit is an abstraction of something else right so 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 a cartoon is really a, an abstraction of an abstraction and it's so i think uh evocative of this world we live in today where so much information is presented to us as a cartoon of something and, and what i was what we're referring to specifically in this article about uh pensions and as you as you say the uh the i, I think it was the either the Illinois state pension or the Chicago you know, city pension, borrowing you know, to invest in the stock market uh, as, as, their, as their way of, of keeping up with their, with their obligations, is that you know, the, both the way this is presented and what they're doing, it, it, it really is an abstraction of an abstraction. We, and, and this isn't just in, in, in pension funds, it's in the overall stock market, it's in the, you know, our, our national government, right? So, Maybe the stock market is the best way to think about this. So we'll talk about pension funds. A pension fund was intended to be a place where you, as a retiree, right, could essentially save for your for for your future and your retirement. And there are these obligations that the fund has towards you, uh, and then you know you pay contributions into that fund, and then you know after you retire, after you leave the employment of your of your you know the, the company that's managing the pension fund, you know, you've got a share in those in, in those proceeds. Just like the stock market used to mean, okay, I'm gonna buy a, a a fractional ownership share in this real life company that's making some real life thing and generating real life cash flows. It, instead, the the cartoon now, and this is true for pension funds, it's true for I say, you know, government is it's, it's true for the stock market, it's become this abstracted thing, uh, really like a casino game, right, where we're not buying something in a real-life company. We're not getting some return from real-life people who are managing the money to give us a retirement income stream. No, it's this, this abstraction of that where it's, it's uh, you know, returns. So, you know, the, 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 the cartoon here uh, that this is, I'll say, um, prudent money management to, to lever up the pension fund, because that, that's that's what you're doing here. You're just taking on leverage, so that you can make a levered bet. In this case, on the stock market. Look, I, there is a a role for leverage. There is a role for borrowing money. Uh, you know, any corporation has to be thinking about it in these terms, right? E even a pension fund, I can see using some form of leverage and low volatility assets and and and, and the like. I, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But what is wrong is the way that it is presented as a cartoon to us to make us believe that it is something other than what it is, yes. right? And, and, and you, you see this with pension funds. Again, you see this with our national government. You see this with every mega asset manager, every Wall Street firm. And, and, and that's what we're writing about, and that's what we're trying to, to get people to, to, to see through. Because once you start seeing the cartoons that are everywhere, once you start seeing what we call in game theory the missionaries who shake their finger at you and tell you how to think about the world, well, you'll start seeing them everywhere. And, and that's really the first step to seeing the world more clearly so that you're not taken advantage of. You know, there's, there's, there's this old saying in poker that if you've been playing poker for 30 minutes and you don't know who the sucker is at the table, it's you, <laughs> right? right? And, and, and so, well, we're not trying to say, oh, you gotta fight the Fed or, oh my God, these, 
pension fund guys are crooks and you got to get out and it's all going to collapse tomorrow. That's not it. What we're saying is don't be the sucker. Don't be the sucker at the table. Understand what's going on behind the scenes and then make your own decisions for how closely you want to participate with that or or not. But, you know, you're smart enough to make up your own damn mind. And, and, and that's that's what we're trying to achieve with Epsilon theory. I mean, that that's great. So I, I want to kind of place that like, OK, we have pensions here. We have yep. you know, politics here. We have, you know, whatever the next story is, because that's what right. other stories. Um, can you put that in like um, like a the, the, the 30,000 foot view? Like, what are we looking at? Because this we can really point them in the United States. But like this is going on everywhere. There are missionaries everywhere telling people these things. So what exactly is a narrative missionary? Well, not only has it been going on, you know, does it go on in, in every country on earth, right? But it's been going on for as long as human beings have come together in some form of society, right? This, this is something that effective politicians have known forever. And it's, it's it, again, I'll, I'll refer back to game theory. It's, it's, it's called the common knowledge game. And, 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 you know, you can look it up on Wikipedia and, and the like. It's, it's, you know, we're familiar with games. We think of the game of chicken and the game of prisoner's dilemma. And these are all interesting games. You know, uh, prisoner's dilemma is the, the, the subplot of every police procedural on television, right? Where, you, you know, so the, these are important. And all we mean by game, again, we're using that in the technical term, like we use the word cartoon. A game is just a strategic interaction. Where, where my actions are contingent on what I think your actions are going to be, and your actions are contingent on what you think my actions are going to be, right? So it's this, this, this game of strategic interactions. But I want to focus on this one game that, that is not so familiar called the common knowledge game, because this is a game that describes the behavior of crowds, right? It, it's not, you know, one prisoner in a holding cell you know, testifying against uh, another prisoner, or it's not, you know, in the game of chicken, like Kevin Bacon on his tractor versus some other guy at his tractor, and who's going to be the chicken, right? The, the common knowledge game is, I'll call it the core game that describes the behavior of crowds. And the, the, the key insight of the common knowledge game is that to really understand crowd behavior, it's not each individual person looking at the speaker, what we call the missionary, you know, that, 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 that famous person on stage, that politician or that, you know, titan of industry or that central banker who's, who's on stage shaking his finger at you and you know, telling you how to think about the world. You know, what really drives the common knowledge game is the crowd looking around at the crowd. Right? So, and, 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 and once you think of it that way, it, it, you start to understand what are the dynamics of this common knowledge game, and you start to understand how effective missionaries, those politicians or central bankers, can construct a message that forces the crowd to look around at themselves. Right? And, and, and again, this is something that, that successful politicians have known forever. Uh, I'll give you some examples, right? So. This is why both coronations and executions used to be held in public. Uh, I guess coronations still are, but executions are, right? And the reason an execution, you know, a beheading in London wasn't held in private, right? <laughs> right? Or, or, you know, but it was held where they could get as big of a crowd as possible to come see it. And the point wasn't, oh, we want a lot of people to see the poor guy getting his head chopped off or getting hanged, right? The point was for the crowd to see the crowd watching the poor guy getting his head chopped off or, or, or getting hanged. It's, it's a phenomenal instrument of social control for the crowd to see a crowd at play. Another quick example. Next time you, you, you listen to a, a political speech by Donald Trump, Right. No, no matter what you think about Donald Trump, you, you have to give him credit that he's a very effective uh, player of the common knowledge game. 
right? And I really think it has to do with his training as a reality TV host, right? But the next time you listen to one of his political speeches, watch for this. The first thing he'll talk about, the very first thing in his speech, he will call the attention of the crowd to the crowd itself, right? He'll say, oh my God, there have never been more people in blah, blah, blah auditorium. We had people lined up you know, two miles to get in here. That's entirely intentional, entirely intentional. Midway through his talk, he'll stop and he'll say, I just want you guys to, you know, what an amazing crowd this is. Well, this is incredible, all these people came together. And then at the end, it's also the last thing he'll say. The very last thing he'll do is he will call the attention of the crowd to the crowd itself. What that does and the way we are hardwired as the human social animal that we are. And there are only a few species on earth that are truly social animals, right? It's us, it's the termite, it's the bee and the ant, right? Not coincidentally, the four most successful species on earth, right? Where we are hardwired is to see that there's a message being given to the crowd and see that the crowd is responding positively to that message. And so we are hardwired to respond positively to the message, not, not because we think in our, in our hearts, oh, you know, we may think, okay, this central banker, this politician, you know, he or she is full of it. I don't believe it personally. But when I see the crowd responding to this, my rational behavior is to act as if I believe it too. It's not stupid of us, it's entirely rational. And that's how these narratives are created. And this is something that politicians have known forever. What's different today is that everyone, from central bankers to corporate CEOs to um, leaders of know, the bureaucrats, team. right? We're all they, they've all they've all figured this out. And you combine that with the power of social media, of you know, regular media, right? The way it, it enters every aspect of our lives. These, these megaphones that exist, these platforms that exist to give voice to the, to the message that a missionary has and call attention of the crowd to itself. That's why these narratives, I think, are, again, they've always been with us, but why they seem to drive us even more today than they ever have. Okay, so I have a little bit of a follow-up on the, uh, the you social animal uh, yeah. concept, right? What's yeah, the difference? E EU social, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's where, yeah, yeah. For the uninitiated, you can Google that. Uh, the diff what's the difference between humans and these other you social animals, right? What, what <laughs> right? Well, I mean, like, why? I mean, obviously, we're mammals and they're insects. Like, what's what's the difference? Why, why are we different? So the, the the difference between humans and termites. Well, there are three. You know, one is that uh, we, we we have opposable thumbs. Okay? Uh, the second is that we have the secret of fire. Uh, and, and and truly, that that that's what humans are. We are giant termites with with opposable thumbs and fire. Right? <laughs> and 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 so the rest of the world never had a chance, literally, because here's the third difference. The third difference is that. The, at the heart of what it means to be a, a truly social animal, or as you say, a you social animal, is that each of these species swims in an ocean of um, intraspecies communication, right? We are, termites, bees, ants, and human beings are constantly giving other bees, termites, ants, and humans messages right, intraspecies community, we swim, we swim in this ocean of messaging. For those three insect species that we talked about, that communication is, is completely hardwired through the, principally through pheromones and chemical transmitters, right, it's completely hardwired. In human beings, right, it's not completely hardwired. We use it, our, our chemicals are our words, or our language, right? So. We can resist, you know, our our, our queen, right? Uh, you, you know, when it was, it was Janet Yellen, right, at the Fed, we can we can resist her her messages, right, a little bit better than than a than an ant 
uh, can can resist its queen's pheromone messages. But the idea is exactly the same. And when you combine literally evolutionary hardwiring to be sensitive to these messages that a, again, a, 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 a we'll call a missionary, somebody who has access to a platform to give their message to you. Right? We're evolutionarily hardwired for this. We've been socially trained to respond to this for tens of thousands of years. And then you have technology today, which puts these messages in front of us 24 seven. That's where it all comes together. So, so like I say, basically we're a termite with opposable thumbs and fire. And now <laughs> we've got this technology that, 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 that really accentuates what we're, what we're developed to respond to. And, uh, you know, that's why I say this, this doesn't get better on its own. We, we don't go back to the way we were. What's important then is to, again, to see it for what it is so that we can devise new ways for us as individuals to, to, to not be the sucker at the table. Uh, that's, that's really what I think it's all about going forward. I mean, I mean that's, that's really resonated with me. That's kind of what brought me to, um, actually the first Epsilon Theory article I ever read was the stalking horse about uh, your, your best friend, Neil Kashkari. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's take a step back. Like, what's, okay, you just explained the concept of a, a narrative missionary. Uh, yeah. Can you go a little bit further and, and give us, what's that, what's that concept of the stalking horse, right? Um, where does that fit in? So the, the stalking horse, and, and this is related to this notion of a missionary, the stalking horse is an old idea, right? So I, I, what I try to write about is, is, is talking about these, these, I think, relatively new ideas for most people, but to, to put it in, in the form, right, a, a story or, or, or a, an analogy from nature. You know, I write a lot about animals on my farm. I, I, I write about you know, history and these ideas a lot. So, so the stalking horse is this really old idea. You know, it, 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 the, you can find tapestries and engravings about the concept of the stalking horse going back, you know, to, to medieval Europe. You know, seriously, right? And, and the idea of the stalking horse is that if you're a hunter and you want to get up close to um, a, you know, you know, a couple of deer in the, in, the, in, in the woods, right? Well, one tried and true way of doing that is to hide behind an animal that the deer aren't afraid of. Uh, and, you know, you know, you see this in movies sometime, you know, Jeremiah Johnson, the old, you know, Western movie. Yeah, great movie, right? And the old trapper is teaching Robert Redford how to hunt elk. And, and so he says, well, yeah, here's the trick. Here's the trick, Sonny. You know, you, you get behind your horse and you walk out in the field and you get close to the elk and then you can shoot them. And uh, this is the idea of the stalking horse that you're hiding behind the horse to, you know, shoot the elk. And, and, uh, and, and Jeremiah Johnson says, the old trapper, he says, well, you know, well, won't the won't they won't they won't the elk see how that that my horse has too many legs, <laughs> right? And 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 Jeremy says, ah, don't be saying, you know, elk don't count the feet that are underneath the the, the horse, right? The, the way I want you to think about so many people who are out there giving us messages. You know, I mean, you mentioned Neil Kashkari, the the, the Minneapolis Fed president. Yeah. We are the elk. <laughs> we we are the elk, and 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 you you have so many um, interests. You know the interest of government, the interest of, of big corporations, and they find people like Neil Kashkari, people who are familiar to us and have a you know accepted role that they play in in our media and the like. And they, they hide behind people like Neil Kashkari so that they can shoot us. <laughs> right? that's, that's, that, that, that's really what it is. And, and so, uh, you know, that, that's what I mean about the, the notion of a stalking horse. So many of the missionaries you were describing, the people who get in behind the microphone and shake their finger at us and tell you how to think about the world, you know, they're, 
if, if it wasn't them, you know, in that role, it'd be someone else. They're 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 non-player characters, you know, in in you know in video game terms. Uh, they're a stalking horse. They're they're a mouthpiece for these ideas that seem reasonable to us. Oh, well, that that sounds right. You know, I never thought of it that way. Not, uh, but it's really an, an attempt to get us to behave the way that they'd like us to behave, whether that's buying stocks or you know voting for this candidate or that candidate. Um, you know, it, again, it's been going on for thousands of years, uh, but now it's just really. They've really gotten good at it. <laughs> they perfected the art, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. Um, so let's let's get back to pensions, right? Sure. Um, why exactly is you know taking out more debt an issue? I know you sort of answered that, but is debt even the biggest issue for these in your like for these pensions in, in your mind? Well, look what what we're talking about. Primarily, when we talk about the pension problem, we're, we're, we're typically talking about public pensions that have obligations uh, to their constituency going forward that seem like they're going to be, be, be hard for the, the, the current assets of the fund to meet, right? And the we, we call that, you know, funding levels typically, right? I mean, where you're, you're talking about, look, you know, you can— calculate what is that that future stream of obligations you see what kind of pool of money you've got right now and then the question is well well how can this pool of money we have right now satisfy those obligations going forward right and for so long um really from the outset the the the, the way to run a pension fund was essentially was is to kick the can down the road yeah, yeah. Uh, because these public pension funds, there are only two ways. There, well, there are three ways to affect that ratio, right? Of, of I've got this pot of money from contributions in the past. I've got this these obligations in the future. Mm -hmm. There are three things I can do to 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 impact this. First is I can invest that money that I've got now to make more money, right? to, 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 to get, and, and, and I can take on more market risk, right? That's, that, 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 that's what I'm gonna do. Borrowing money is a way not just of, of, of you know, taking on more market risk in terms of my allocation of the pot I've got, but to say, I've got such a great idea on how to make more money, I'm going to, to borrow at a low rate today, right? Because I think I'm going to make even more money with that borrowed money. That's how I'm going to try to, 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 to make up the difference. The other two ways, and, and, and more and more funds are going that route because the other two ways of, let's say, bridging that gap are politically impossible today, right? You can either restructure the benefits, <laughs> right? You know, you can say, <laughs> Sorry, guys. You know, I know we told you, you know, we were going to pay you this amount going forward, but eh, we, we can't do it. Can't do it. So, you know, we're going to have to restructure your benefits. I, I mean, you're you're essentially an, an elected official, or you're 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 you are a politician if you're managing a, a public pension today. You know, imagine doing that, right? Yeah. Say, oh, sorry, guys, can't do it. Right? Sorry, guys, we broke the promise. You broke the promise, and so you're going to be out. Because there are all sorts of people who will say, well, I can do it. You know, I can I can fix that problem. And of course, the way they'll fix that problem is to borrow and, you know, to, to, to use leverage. The other way that, that, that people have always said, you know, we can fix the problem is to raise the contributions, which are often taxes, of the people today, right? Those are the only three answers you've got. Those yep. are the only three answers you've got. You can, you can restructure the benefits, reduce the benefits. You can increase the contributions, right? or you can try to make more money with what you got. Right? And the first two are so politically unpalatable, even though, sorry, my view is, that's really what you should be doing, right? That's reality. Mm -hmm. So instead, as always happens, you take the, the I'll, I'll call it the easy way out, and you, you, you borrow money to, to try to make more money through debt and leverage. 
And the real kicker to this, Drew, is that's not just what's happening on the city and state public pensions. It's absolutely what's happening with our national government and our national debt today. We're levering up. It's all the same thing, whether you're talking about at the highest levels or at these individual pension funds. As above, so below, as you say. Exactly. Um, so you have this concept of the Icarus moment, and it, which is sort of where, you know, I mean, I'll let you explain it, but what do you think an Icarus moment for pensions might look like? Yeah, you know, it's not going to be, I think, the, um, the crash, right? That, that, that's the way that most people are, 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 are talking about it today, uh, that, the, the, that what breaks the pension funds and what breaks, uh, you, you look at our national debt as well, is that, oh my God, there's going to be some you know, crash in the stock market. I actually think that's pretty unlikely. I, I actually think that that's the last war, and people are always fighting the last war. They think that the next war is going to be something like the great financial crisis, mm -hmm. uh, where stocks can, you know, the stock market's down, I don't know, 30, 40 percent or something like that. Yeah. I think that what central bankers have constructed and Wall Street and governments have constructed over the last 10 years is I'll call it a, a Maginot line to protect against a deflationary shock. And, and, and so I, I think the idea of, of even, look, I, I think the coronavirus is going to test this. You know, that's a deflationary shock of, of enormous proportions. But I, I, I actually think that, that, that what is more likely to uh, be the, 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 the next war we fight is not from a deflationary shock, but an inflationary shock, something that we haven't, which often doesn't feel like a shock. It, 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 you know, there's this old country song that falling feels like flying for a little while. Right, uh, and and I really think that that's what we're going to see in terms of the inflationary uh, environment that's coming down the pike. Uh, ultimately, there is a fall, right? Ultimately, you do hit the ground with a really sudden shock, uh, but it doesn't feel like these deflationary shocks, like oh my God, prices are declining. Mm -hmm. It's this inflationary environment, which ultimately leads to this decline of purchasing power. It, and ultimately leads to just as big a problem for the retirees as the as a deflationary market shock would do. That's where I think we're going. I mean, it, it's certainly a very compelling argument in my eyes. But my next question is, um, what? So, a, are we anywhere near like maybe what that inflationary shock is? And I know this is a terribly unfair question, but you wrote a blog called Utton on the It, and if you haven't read it yet, you should read it. Um, but how do you think the birds from this pension cartoon are going to, quote unquote, come home to roost? If you have, I mean, I know it's an unfair question, like yeah. predict the future, but, you know, you're much wiser than I, so. No, I no, 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 no. Look, so it, it, it goes back to what I was saying about the. <sighs> hey, we actually just had a little technical yeah. difficulty. I'm just going to re-ask uh, the question. So, okay, great. Thanks. Um, ben just talked about the, the you know, the quote unquote Icarus moment. I mean, if you don't know the, the tale of Daedalus and Icarus, then you should probably brush up on your Greek mythology. <laughs> but uh, why do you think we're maybe even near that moment? And in, you know, in Epsilon Theory, you wrote a blog called Utton on the Its. And yeah. uh, I know this is a terribly unfair question, but how do you think the birds from the pension cartoon are going to quote unquote come home to roost. Well, well, putting on the Ritz, you know, that's that's actually a quote from um, you know Young Frankenstein, right? So uh, you know that Gene Wilder movie is just it's just it's just so good, right? Uh, and you know, for for those of you who are unfamiliar with the movie, right? So it's a retelling of the, the Doctor Frankenstein story where where Doctor Frankenstein or Frankenstein, right, as they say in the movie, right? You know, he creates this monster. He creates life. Right? And so what does he do with that, you know, amazing gift? Well, he decides to put on this vaudeville show, right, where the, the monster goes out and sings and dances. And, of, of course, you, you know, 
he's not very good at the singing and the dancing. You know, he's singing this song, putting on the Ritz, mm -hmm. and all he can manage is putting on the Ritz. <laughs> and the brilliance of this, right, is that here someone has cre created life, you know, this enormous, you know, achievement. And what do you do with that achievement, right? You put on a show. There you and, go. And, and, and ultimately, you know, you're putting on the show and, and, oh my God, you've had this achievement, but okay, so what if you can't, you know, sing and dance? But, but that's where we are right now, right? That's where we are in terms of markets. That's where we are in politics. It's not enough, right, that, that we've, you know, recovered from the great financial crisis, that, that, that we, we've got a growing healthy economy, uh, that, that, that we've got a uh, democratic political system that I, I think is, you know, is the envy of the world and, and, and has the, the, the ability to really drive us, us, us forward as, as a people, as a species, as everything, right? No, that's not enough. You know, <laughs> can you sing and dance? Can you, can you, can you give us a tune, right? Yeah. And, and that's, that's what we've become. We've become so addicted. We, you know, markets, voters, we've, we've become so utterly addicted to the notion that business cycles are over, that it, that it can all be for good, and there's only one direction, you know, up and to the right, you know, for, 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 for everything in all times, that we don't have to suffer any consequences or pay any sacrifice. We don't have to pay any sacrifice for the wars we want to fight. We don't have to pay any sacrifice for the you know, the, the economy we want to have, the growth we want to have, the society we want to have, it's going to all be held without a price. That, that's what we have become. Mm -hmm. and, and, and ultimately, right, that fails. Yep. Ultimately, that fails. You're, you're absolutely seeing signs of it today, uh, I, I think more on the political side of the world than, than, than in market world. I think in market world where ultimately it comes home to roost is again what I'm describing where you move beyond inflation within financial assets mm -hmm. where it's been kind of captured today and where inflation gets into the real economy mm -hmm. through massive deficit spending, through massive tax cuts that only go to the, you know, one tenth or, you know, the one percent at best, right? That's what drives, I think, a political polarization Mm -hmm. an inflationary environment that ultimately, you know, leads to the show not being able to go on. Yep. But that's what I'm thinking. Okay. Well, I mean, certainly very eloquent. I, all right, so moving on from there, right, I, I'd like to talk about a little bit, all right, I'm a little bit of a literature nerd, I'll, I'll preface okay. it, right? Great. So, uh, when I read the, the Epsilon Theory note uh, where you talk about, Eps or, excuse me, William Blake and Tiger, Tiger, and yeah. uh, the poem Tiger, Tiger, right? And yeah. I mean, there's a very, there's a great, uh, there's a great William Blake quote, which is, the art of tree is life, the science, science is, or sorry, excuse me, art is the tree of life, science yeah. is the tree of death. Tree of death, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think that, like, really ties things together, and, and I'll let you do it, but how does that relate to, you know, your three-body problem and how kind of people view markets these days? Yeah. Well, you know, missionaries, you know, these the, 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 the people, you know, standing behind the, the, the microphone and shaking their finger at you and telling you how to think of the world. Mm -hmm. It's often a person, right? We can, you know, there, there's, a, there's a person that gets behind that microphone and does it. But it's not just a person, right? In fact, I, I think the most powerful missionaries are these, I'll call it with a, it's like science with a capital S, right? The voice of authority, where authority, again, can be science with a capital S, where it can be, uh, you know, doctors with a capital D, right? There's the, that, that voice of authority that, that, you know, is probably the most powerful missionary there is out there. So when, when, when William Blake was talking about how, you know, science is the, the tree of death, right, which is, you know, pretty, pretty hard stuff, right? I think what he was really talking about is this notion of science with a capital S, yeah. uh, where, where it, it, it's not the scientific method, right? It, it's not the, the, the human 
um, drive to try to find answers and think about things rigorously, that, that's, you know, to solve problems and to, to, to invent, right? That's not it. It's that science with a capital S, that constructing, I'll say, names for things, um, categorizing things, again, telling you how to think about the world, how to organize the world, mm -hmm. that's, that's so often, again, a stalking horse, right? It's, it, it's so often, these are ideas that we just take, oh yeah, that sounds right, we take for granted, that are, you know, they could be fine. Again, I'm not telling you to fight this, fight the Fed or fight whatever, but I'm saying to look and see, you know, whose interests are being served by this. Mm -hmm. uh, and because a lot of times it's not yours. <laughs> it's not your interest that are being served by this. And, and you know, I, I think you see that around the coronavirus where science with a capital S in the form of the World Health Organization just parrots the, the, the Chinese government statistics here uh, with no, you know, they, they, they have their own scientists who are publishing stuff saying this Chinese data is a crock. It's a crock. And yet the World Health Organization with that, you know, the authority that's, that's vested in that, right? It, you know, they, they, they are giving the Chinese government's party line, literally the party line, uh, as if it were, you know, the, the truth with a capital T. And, and, and again, once you start looking for this stuff, you see it everywhere. You, you, you see it from Wall Street, you see it from politics. And uh, again, I, I'm not saying to, you know, because I don't think you can take to the streets and, oh my God, I, and we, can, we can revolt. But what we have to do is we have to take our distance, right? We have to do three things, I think. We have to first take back our vote, meaning we, we don't vote for ridiculous candidates just because we're told, oh, you have to. We take back our data, right? We, we don't give our information out to these giant tech companies or to the state just because it, it leads to a convenience for us. Mm -hmm. The third and most important is we take back our distance. And, and that doesn't just mean our physical distance. It means our, our distance of, 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 of mind, frankly, that, that, we are, that, that we have a healthy skepticism for what we're told, uh, where people shake their finger at us. Um, you know, we're not, we're, not, we're not saying that we're going to, you know, put on our tinfoil hat and move off the grid. What we're saying is that, that, that we're going to maintain our own autonomy of mind. That, to me, is at the heart of how we survive, frankly, uh, you know, this world that we're in today. Okay. Well, I mean, that's a great transition. So this is going to be our last question that's, that I wrote. Uh, <laughs> we have a bunch of questions from, you know, viewers, and a few people actually wrote in beforehand. So... Let me, let me get to the last question, and then we'll, we'll get to that stuff. Right. So in light of, like, it's a pretty daunting issue, this, you know, concept of the nudging oligarchy and nudging state, which is what you're talking about, right? And if they're not pushing you, they're not forcing you to do anything. They're nudging you to behave in a way that works for them, right? Yep. And in light of that, and, and you know, sort of this failure of institutions is kind of what we're describing, and, you know, definitely the breakdown in trust. Uh, I'd like to end on a little bit more of a positive note. Can you explain what you mean by make, protect, teach? And uh, I'm a big football fan, so the clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. That, that is a message that I think most Americans can get. What do, what do you mean by that? So I'll start with the second. So, you know, uh, clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose, right? It's from, from Friday Night Lights, right? Which was, uh, you know, a great book, a good movie, and a great TV series. And, and it's about high school football in, you know, Odessa, Texas. Yeah. Which is to say it's about life, <laughs> right? Like, it's about life. Yeah. And, and, and the idea is how you can come together as a team, what we li I like to call a pack, right? right. And, and, and that, that is ultimately our protection. It's the only protection we've got, you know, for making our way in what I like to call a fallen world. Right? Uh, you know, because the, as you say, it's, 
it is the failure of institutions. It, it is, it's what always happens, right? This is not the first time in the history of the world that these institutions fail, uh, where political parties become just vehicles for rent, right, or for hire, right? Yeah. You know, Bloomberg wants to hire the Democratic Party. Trump's already bought the, you know, the Republican Party. It, you know, this is what happens. This is how things fall apart. Yep. And, and what you say, what is the answer? I, I believe it so strongly. The, the answer is not to say, oh, I'm going to try to do some top-down, um, you know, saving of the world. I'm, I'm going to get involved in Democratic Party politics and going to rescue this from, from above. Look, I, I, I got to tell you, folks, that, that ship has sailed. That ship has sailed. Uh, that, that what we have to do is what, you know, frankly, St. Augustine did, you know, uh, you know, 1,500 years ago, 1,600 years ago. You, you, you've got to take back your distance, and you've got to make a difference now from the bottom up, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's where things change. And it, it, it's, not, it's not a quick fix, mm -hmm. right? It, this, this is something that takes a lifetime, more. And that's fine with me. We're playing the long game here. But the only thing that can ultimately rebuild and reshape our society the way we want to, which for me at least, is to recapture the small L liberal ideas of yeah, liberty and justice for all. Imagine that. Right? What? Right? Yeah, exactly, right? Mm -hmm. And the small C conservative ideas of having a sense of honor and shame. Those are two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. Having an, a, a respect for the past and that, you know, they weren't all dummies and idiots who lived before us, but they had some pretty good ideas. Mm -hmm. Keeping those small L liberal ideas alive, keeping the small C conservative ideas alive, it, it happens from bottom up, right? It, it happens in our families. It happens in our communities. That's where we each can make a real difference. And, 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 you know, and we're not alone in doing this. The, you know, I started writing Epsilon Theory from a, a pretty dark place, right? The, the world it just seemed so atomized and I, I felt like I was alone. But the, it's been so personally uplifting to me. And it's the, you know, the best thing in my life to realize there are Tens of thousands of people, men, women, young, old, every country on earth, who are wrestling with these same issues, who have a commitment to the small L liberal ideas of liberty and justice for all, who, who have a commitment to the small C conservative ideas of, of honoring the past and, and, you know, having a sense of obligation for the future. Right? We're not alone. And so, so what I think we can really do is find ways to express that, to make a difference, you know, not by starting a political party or, or, or something like that, but it's, it's, a, it's the politics and the investing of distance, right, of, of, of pushing back from the casino table that is markets today, pushing back from the constructed politics of us versus them that is today and saying, you know, we're not going to play that game. We're going to play a different game. We're going to invest and, and, and engage in commerce with, with our PAC, right? We're going to, to, to help our PAC and our extended PAC, not because it's instrumentally good to us, but because this is what human beings should do. Right? This is how we keep those small L liberal virtues and small C conservative virtues alive. And, you know, that's, that's why we write. This is why we fight. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're going to start having, you know, big national meetups on this. We're doing lots of regional uh, meetings of this. It really is constructing, you know, like to use that kind of revolutionary language, you, you create a cell. Yeah. Right? Of, 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 of believers in those small L liberal virtues and small C conservative virtues. It is a social movement that, that I know it sounds highfalutin, but that, that's what I want to try to advance here. 
Because it's, it, it's like Margaret Mead said, I'll, I'll paraphrase her here, right? That never doubt the power of a small committed group of citizens to change the world. Hey. Because in fact, that that's the only people who ever have changed the world. Well, I mean, there's 100,000 people in the pack, so it doesn't sound like it's that small. It sounds pretty damn big. And it's growing. It's growing, yeah. it's, it's, it's growing enormously. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, there's certainly a reason for that. And uh, I want to thank you so much for answering my questions. That was literally a bucket list item for me. <laughs> I just did. I'm, I'm over the moon right now. But Anytime. We have a few questions, right, sure. from, from our viewers. But this is beforehand. Um, I think the first one I'm going to ask is, I mean, obviously you've been on this coronavirus story this morning. Yep. Twitter actually uh, made your tweets sensitive about it. <laughs> Which is, it, that, that's a whole nother story that, I mean, you and I could have a whole nother hour conversation about that. You sure could. Um, and I'd love to do it on Real Vision if you're, if you're up for it, maybe in a few months. But um, what are the knock-on effects that this coronavirus has? Like, everyone's telling me, I mean, uh, you wrote an article today about the head of the WHO. Yep. What are the knock-on effects of this? Well, uh, let me describe it this way. So... Yesterday, I think on that cruise ship, you know, that's, you know, in quarantine in Yokohama Harbor or wherever it is, you know, you had whatever it was, you know, 120 new cases, 120 new confirmed cases on this cruise ship of 3,000 people. Uh, and, you know, outside of Hubei province in, 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 in China, counting the whole rest of the world, supposedly we only had another, you know, we had fewer cases than that. Yeah, right? yeah. You know, yeah. Confirmed in the entire world. Right? So the genie's out of the bottle here. I, I, I you know, if, if, and this is, you know, not me saying this, these, this is, you know, who sponsored scientists say, you know, actually we think the, the, the R0, the uncontrolled propagation rate of, of this, this virus is like, between six and seven, right? Which is just, oh my God, right? That's just genealogy. That's absurd. Yeah, it's it's absurd. So, so right. So this is the, the the exponential spread of this virus, which which we still don't know how it's being spread, right? It's just, I mean, this is this is going everywhere. I think, I think. Uh, but so so another piece of news came out of, of Japan today, where the Tokyo Marathon, yeah, perfect, has canceled. Fun. All of the, uh, I'll call it the, 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 the general interest, the public runners, this, right? So, so the, the Tokyo Marathon is now going to be limited to the invitation only list, you know, the, the, the top 200 marathon runners of the world. And, you know, for, for this audience, you know, maybe the, the New York or Boston Marathon is a more, you know, but it's run the same way as the Tokyo Marathon. You've got, they invite 100 or so runners, and otherwise, you submit. You know, you've been running, and they admit, and so they have like ten thousand people running the race. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you're gonna have two hundred people instead of ten thousand people running the Tokyo Marathon. I think that's exactly the right thing to do. I, I think that whoever is organizing the Tokyo Marathon is being really smart about this. Mm -hmm. uh, my point is that this idea of we're going to have to start canceling public events like the Olympics. Right. The notion of, uh, right, is there going to be an NFL season next year in, with, with stadiums full? I, I know that seems crazy, but, you know, if you're not, if you're, if you're involved with anything to do with, uh, I'll say, public events, like your professional sports league, mm -hmm. and you're not making contingency plans now, mm -hmm. we're like, oh, well, we're just going to do our games in front of the TV cameras, right? We can't have... 30,000 people or 50,000 people getting together in one because they're not going to come together. No. I, you know, this, this, <laughs> this is what we're going to be talking about in six months. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's not, you know, I, I think that actually that the, this, this virus can be quite survivable. Yeah. I think that what happened in China was that the healthcare facilities were, were just overrun, swamped. Yeah. And that's why they had to graduate to these these really draconian measures of just shutting down entire cities of you know ten plus million people. It's because they were not prepared in their uh, with their uh, health professionals in terms of the, the the training or the equipment. So 
you know, I think that's where we are right now, where we have to start getting off this game of, oh, how many confirmed cases did we have in, you know, Egypt and Indonesia? Who cares, right? Yeah, doesn't the matter. Issue is, in Indonesian hospitals, you know, we need the healthcare professionals prepared for when you start treating this, that the doctors and the nurses are not themselves getting sick and the entire, the entire healthcare system breaks down. You know, that's what happened in Wuhan. Uh, and that's what we have to avoid happening anywhere else in the world. All right. In the interest of time, I'm just going to run down a few. Um, this is one from one of the people that were watching live. Do you think that governments um, addressing the massive pension underfunding might actually just nationalize all the pensions and have a national pension program, kind of like, you know, how people are talking about a debt jubilee, a pension jubilee? Well, we, we kind of do now, right? So, so, so there is a, a pension insurance fund, right? And it's, it's for, for private pensions, right? Where uh, the government is there to backstop the failure of a uh, private pension fund. My, look, the, the national government is also there to backstop every public pension fund. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the, the ideas of Jubilee it's it's clearly happening, right? And, and and this is not a Democrat, Republican. This is not a left right thing. You know, Donald Trump, for God's sake, is running trillion dollar deficits, and you know he'll have a two billion dollar or two trillion dollar you know debt fund coming out if he's reelected. He'll call it you know keep America great fund, right? Or make if a Democrat's elected, they'll do a trillion dollar. You know, debt issuance, they'll just call it a green fund. Mm -hmm. It's the same damn thing. Yep. Right. Uh, so, so, so absolutely, there is, um, you know, a public backstop for this. Mm -hmm. what, what my point is, is that what this will lead to is a shift in this 40 year deflationary cycle that we've been, you know, enjoying, frankly, mm -hmm. right? From, an in, from a deflationary environment to an inflationary environment. Um, that's what happens. Uh, you, you know, it, it's how inflation leaves just financial assets and gets out into the real world. Yep. But if the question is, yes, there's a backstop, there already is mm -hmm. uh, in, in law for private pension funds and in practice for public pension funds as well. So that's why I don't get worked up about, you know, oh my God, the pension funds are not gonna be able to pay their money. I don't think a deflationary shock is likely, and if that were the case, the the, the federal government is going to, you know, is going to step in. All right. So this is the last question, and uh, it's pretty interesting. And I mean, this guy is very fortunate. His name's Dale. Uh, I'm 64 and retired. I have all my retirement funds in gold and silver, with some in the mining stocks. So he's probably a huge Real Vision viewer. <laughs> Because of the central bank world and how it's indicated low rates and some version of QE as far as the eye can see, as long as all he needs to do is maintain his purchasing power of his existing wealth, is there anything wrong with his strategy? Like, it, it may not be in the mainstream, but if he just needs to maintain his purchasing power. So, you know, I mentioned, you know, we're always fighting the last war. Yeah. And um, I, listen, I, I, I I, I think that gold, precious metals, even Bitcoin is a good, I'll, I'll call it, I'm, I'm going to call it a trade, right? Or at least I'll call Bitcoin a trade. Gold, I think, is more than a trade, right? And, and I understand that you're looking at this to maintain your purchasing power if, if we have an inflationary environment. And also, if you have a crushing, you know, deflationary shock, as unlikely as I think that is, um, you know, I, I, I get the value of, of gold in that respect also. Mm -hmm. All I will say, though, is, is that, you know, the, the next war is always a little different from, from, from the last war. And when I think about, you know, my investing, right, what I'm, I'm all for pushing away from the casino table. You know, like I said, exactly what right? that sounded like to me. But 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 what that also means for me is I want to invest in uh, I'll call it tangible cash flows mm -hmm. of real businesses in the real economy that have real purchasing power. Yep. Because that 
you know, they talk about location, location, location as being the most important things for like fast food. Right? In an inflationary environment, the most important things are pricing power, pricing power, pricing power. Yep. So I, I, my preference, the way I think about maintaining my purchasing power is to invest in the real economy with fractional ownership shares of yep. real cash flowing businesses that have real purchasing power, right? That are price givers rather than price takers. You sound like that not part of the casino. You sound like Benjamin Graham. You know, I'm, I, I, I'm happy to be in that company. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was a, an amazing experience for me. I hope everyone who was watching, you know, got as much out of it as possible. If there were some things in there that maybe you as the viewer didn't get, Epsilon Theory explains most of the stuff that we talk about much better than, you know, <laughs> an hour-long conversation, right? It's in, you know, concrete writing, and it's going to be there hopefully forever. So go check that out. Also, uh, if you're watching on YouTube or LinkedIn or, or wherever, and you're not on Real Vision Access, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to get with Real Vision. So um, shameless, shameless plug. But, you know, look at it. There's a $1 subscription. Sign up for a month, and uh, I promise you, you'll like it. So, um, you know, thank you so much to Ben. Um, you know, this is a really great experience, and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Drew. All right, take care.